When felons commit crimes, they typically try to get away with it by denying that they know anything about the offence, aided by the fact that detectives can't read their minds and know they're lying. However, there is in fact a technique for detecting this guilty knowledge in the brain, called brain fingerprinting. Brain fingerprinting is a controversial neuroscientific technique which was developed by the FBI in 1995. The way that the technique works is by exploiting characteristic brainwaves which are generated when a subject has knowledge about something, whether the subject admits to having this knowledge or denies it. The argument being that if you know it, they'll know it, as your brain won't be able to hide it. Using this brain fingerprinting method, the FBI, CIA and US Navy have all claimed a 100% accuracy rate in detecting guilty concealed information by reading these brain waves. This was achieved in over 200 experiments which have been conducted by the FBI agent who created the technique. It has been used to catch a serial killer, to free a wrongly imprisoned man and to identify people involved in terrorist organisations. This video is all about how brain fingerprinting was invented, its many controversies, and how it has been used by police and intelligence organisations across the world to try to identify guilty suspects and to solve crimes. The purpose of this section is to look at the neuroscience of how to read brain waves. For decades now, neuroscientists have been able to infer different brain states and brain processes by looking at the brain's electrical activity. This information is critical to understanding how brain fingerprinting works and is the underlying science which was utilised by the FBI in order to create the technique. Brain waves are electrical impulses. When neurons in the brain are activated, they fire electrically. This electrical activity can then be detected by placing electrodes on the scalp, in a method called electroencephalography, or EEG. This is because electrodes record electrical activity from millions of neurons, which are activated and synchronised with each other. Depending on what your brain is doing, whether it's sleeping, resting, thinking or problem solving, the neurons involved in these different tasks release different brain waves or brain waves at different oscillations, which are represented in real time on the EEG monitor. There are many different types of these neural oscillations, and simply by looking at the oscillation you can determine what kind of brain state or brain process is going on in that person's brain, as each oscillation occurs during a certain type of brain state. For example, there are delta wave oscillations which occur during deep sleep, versus gamma oscillations which occur during problem solving and other more complicated cognitive tasks. But it gets even more specific than that. Just by looking at these simple brainwave oscillations, scientists can also determine things like whether your eyes are open or closed, or whether you are concentrating on something that you can see versus something that you can hear. Or they can even detect which person you are paying attention to if you can hear multiple people around you speaking at the same time such as if you're at a cocktail party and eavesdropping on another group's conversation. But it's not just simple oscillations which can tell us about what is going on in your brain and what you are doing inside of your own mind. Say you are sitting in a lab with a neuroscientist who has stuck a whole bunch of electrodes onto your head. You have been instructed to simply sit there and look at a blank computer screen. For several moments you watch the screen and then you suddenly see an image appear, which is called the stimulus. This stimulus is then presented multiple times, and each time you see it, your brain generates something called an event-related potential, or ERP. There are different types of these event-related potentials, depending on what the stimulus was that you experienced. For example, if the stimulus is a sound, this generates an auditory ERP, which looks like this. And as we can see, the auditory ERP is formed of these characteristic peaks and dips in the signal. So this is what the ERP looks like each time you hear something. Another type of ERP is a visual ERP. Again, this means that each time you see a visual stimulus, 
your brain produces a characteristic ERP response with these particular characteristic peaks and dips in the signal. So the waveform looks a little different when comparing auditory ERPs to visual ERPs in the sense of differing patterns of peaks and dips in the signal, which each have their own labels as reflected by the Roman numerals or with later labels such as the NA or P2. These peaks and dips are the most prominent ones for these kinds of ERPs. The N in these labels simply means a negative decrease in voltage, whereas P means a positive increase in voltage. The numbers refer to how many seconds or milliseconds that the peak or dip appeared after the stimulus was shown. For example, a P1 is a positive deflection which occurs 1 second or 100 milliseconds after the auditory or visual stimulus was presented. And what is amazing about this is that these peaks and dips also reflect specific processes in the brain. For example, the visual N1 appears whenever you see something new or unexpected. For example, a new stimulus appearing on the computer screen. On the other hand, N2s reflect increased attention to a stimulus. And other more interesting peaks can also include an N170, for example, which is generated whenever you see someone's face. So not only can neuroscientists read brain states using oscillations, they can also detect when you process a certain stimulus and what that stimulus is that you are processing using these ERPs. In this way, they can deduce what you are experiencing and how your brain is processing it. But what is also noteworthy here is that the ERP activity generated by a stimulus is time-locked to the stimulus. This basically just means that earlier parts of the ERP reflects activity which is generated within earlier parts of the auditory or visual pathway. To use the example of sound, the sound wave enters your ears and hits your eardrums, and this energy in the form of sound waves is converted into electrical signals. These sound waves are captured by the acoustic nerve and delivered up through the brainstem and into a part of the brain called the thalamus. From there, the signal then travels to specific specialised areas within the cerebral cortex, which is the outer surface of your brain, to be further processed. In the case of sounds, it gets sent to the temporal lobe, where the primary auditory cortex is, by your ears. We can see this reflected in the auditory ERP signal, at peaks 1 to 5, which reflect electrical activity from the brainstem whereas later peaks reflect electrical activity which is produced higher up in the auditory pathway. Here, the auditory ERP is therefore detected at the temporal lobe. And what is also interesting about auditory ERPs is that they are also generated whenever you expect to hear something, including when you plan to speak, so to generate speech, and also when you are simply thinking, and thereby generating internal speech. However, while neurotypical brains suppress these internally generated auditory ERPs to a large extent, people with schizophrenia fail to adequately suppress them and experience auditory hallucinations as a result, under the corollary discharge mechanism of auditory verbal hallucinations, which propose that schizophrenic brains are unable to consistently identify their internal speech or thoughts as their own and mistakenly attribute them to the external world. But back to the different types of ERPs. A similar concept to the auditory ERPs underlies the visual ERP, except of course, instead of sound entering your ears, light travels to the back of your eyes, through your optic nerve and up through the brain to the cerebral cortex, this time to the occipital lobe where the primary visual cortex is, right at the back of your head. And like I said, because the ERP signal is time-locked to the stimulus, this means that later parts of the ERP signal are detected by electrodes placed in the vicinity of these specialised cortical areas. And this fact will become relevant to us later when detecting concealed knowledge in the brain. But for now, a quick summary. Neuroscientists can distinguish what kind of brain state someone is in based upon their neural oscillations, and they can also identify what kind of sensory or perceptual brain process is going on such as what kind of sensory stimulus is being processed using these ERPs. So these brain signals, or brain waves, are very informative and display specific neural processes, which can be detected by scientists. This has been known for a very long time. Furthermore, some technologies have already been developed to exploit this. For example, Brain Computer Interface, or BCI, is technology which utilises these peaks and dips to enable a patient with locked-in paralysis 
to communicate or make movements. Another example is technology which utilises auditory ERPs as a consciousness detector for surgically induced anaesthesia. This is useful because many patients who are made unconscious for surgery often unfortunately remain conscious during their surgery, experiencing pain but being unable to move and signal that they are actually still conscious. However, because a person who is fully conscious will exhibit an altered auditory ERP at the so-called mid-latency portion of the ERP, it has therefore been proposed that these auditory ERPs can be utilised to detect whether a surgical patient is truly unconscious or not. Originally, however, scientists only recorded and analysed the electrical responses during the early part of the ERP. In other words, during the first 100 milliseconds after a stimulus was presented, this was because they were only interested in analysing sensory processing, and so they didn't realise that anything interesting was actually occurring after the first second. However, in the 1960s, neuroscientists finally started to look at the so-called late parts of the ERP. They discovered that yet another important positive peak occurs when you recognise something, and this peak is called the P300, which is a positive peak at 300 milliseconds and it is this peak that the FBI became interested in. A standard test for generating this peak is called the oddball paradigm. Here, participants are repeatedly shown the same type of stimulus on the computer screen, for example a box. After the box is shown several times, a new type of stimulus is then shown, for example a circle. When this new type of stimulus is shown, this generates a P300. This is because when the sensory input comes in, and sensory processing occurs, these perceptual features are also being compared with your memory of the previous stimulus. If the stimulus is perceived as being of the same category as the previous one, then no P300 is generated. If however it is perceived as being of a different category, then a P300 is generated. In these oddball experiments, it was initially interpreted that the P300 is simply generated in response to novelty whereas further evidence suggests that it is in fact the brain updating your contextual understanding of what you are seeing, such as you categorising the new stimulus into a separate category from the last stimulus, under the context updating theory of P300. Here, the context being updated is the type of image you are seeing. So if you understand that the image is conceptually different in some way from the previous stimulus, you release a P300. But why is a boring paradigm like this interesting or useful in the context of a potential lie detector? In 1983, a paper was published by Monica Fabiani and her colleagues, titled P300 and Memory. In this paper, she and her colleagues used a modified version of this task, but replaced the shapes with words. She and her colleagues trained participants to memorise a list of words, and then two days later, the participants were required to return to her lab where they were then shown a new list of words. However, some of these words on the new list were the same words from the first list, just randomly presented amongst the new words. Fabiani and her colleagues found that whenever the participants saw the familiar words from the first list, their brains exhibited a P300 when they recognised the old words. This made waves in the neuroscience community, because it demonstrated that the P300 can be used not just as an indicator of context updating in a working memory paradigm, but also as an index of long-term memory and recognition. It therefore became obvious, to both neuroscientists and to the FBI, that they could construct a lie detector version of the oddball test. Instead of using simple shapes or words, they could use stimuli from a specific crime such as images related to the crime such as a weapon, or by using words which specify the details of the crime, and mix these up with non-crime related stimuli. By presenting this P300 based lie detector test to guilty and innocent suspects, guilty suspects should therefore be able to be identified, because their brains should generate P300s in response to the crime related stimuli, because they would recognise the crime-related stimuli as being different from the non-crime-related stimuli. This memory of the crime-related stimuli and the P300 that is generated could then be read by the neuroscientist, or FBI agent, thereby identifying the suspect as guilty. And in fact, this also suggested that not only could standard criminals potentially be identified in this way, 
but also members of any secret organisations, such as members of terrorist groups. This could be achieved by simply swapping the crime-related stimuli for confidential stimuli that only a member of a specific terrorist organisation would know, by using their own code words as stimuli, for example. As a result, neuroscientists and various intelligence organisations teamed up to investigate whether brainwaves could indeed be used to detect criminals and to solve crimes. We will now turn our attention to part 2, when neuroscientists first began investigating the P300 as a potential lie detector. The very first brain fingerprinting experiments took place in America, within the Midwestern state of Illinois. Here, the first neuroscientist to officially recognise the potential of the P300 in lie detection were J.P. Rosenfeld and his colleagues at Northwestern University. They therefore set out to pioneer the first P300-based lie detection experiment. Here, Rosenfeld and his colleagues constructed a mock crime scenario, using 16 participants who were assigned into two groups. The first group in their experiment was the guilty group, whilst the other participants were assigned to the innocent group. Each individual was then invited separately into the lab. The participants assigned to the guilty group were then presented with a box, containing nine different items. The participants were then told to steal one of these nine items and to place their stolen item into their purse or pocket. These items included things like a wallet, phone or a camera, the participants assigned to the innocent group, however, were not shown the box and did not take part in the stealing task. Then the next part of the experiment began, which involved both the guilty and innocent participants sitting in front of a computer screen to complete the P300 test, which of course was a modified version of the oddball paradigm. Here they were informed that during this test, they would be shown words one by one at random on the screen. The first type of words that they saw were called novel stimuli. These were new words which they had not seen before in the context of the experiment, and therefore should not be recognised as significant, and therefore should not generate a P300 in any of the participants' brains. Whereas the second type of words were called probe stimuli. These words were the items that each particular participant had stolen, which were shown several times throughout the experiment. Therefore, these words should be recognised by the guilty participant as the item that they had stolen and the probe should generate a P300 in the guilty participant who had stolen it. Conversely though, these same probe words should not be recognised by the innocent subjects as they hadn't stolen the item and therefore did not know the significance of the probe. Therefore, by presenting the probes, this should theoretically enable the guilty subject to be identified through the generation of the P300 whenever the guilty subjects see the stolen item. And that is exactly what happened during their experiment. Here you can see the average ERP responses for one particular guilty subject. The top two ERPs are responses to specific novel words. The third ERP shows the response to the probe word, in this case to the word camera. And the fourth ERP shows the averaged response to all of the irrelevant or novel words. And as you can see, there is a P300 response specifically to the probe, indicating that the participant recognised the camera, indicating that this particular participant had stolen this particular item. And overall, in 90% of cases, the guilty subject and their stolen item could be identified. In other words, out of all 10 participants who had stolen an item, 9 of them showed distinct P300s in response to the probe items they had stolen, enabling the majority of them to be identified as the thief. In contrast, the innocent subjects did not generate a P300 towards these probes, and for both guilty and innocent groups, no one generated a P300 in response to the novel stimuli. Therefore, Rosenfeld and his colleagues concluded at the end of their 1988 paper that the P300 could potentially be a suitable paradigm for lie detection. <laughs>
though they did acknowledge that further research into the technique was needed. Perhaps predictably, Rosenfeld's paper generated a wide response, including just a few hours away in Illinois, where yet another scientist happened to be working, called Emmanuel Donchin. Donchin was a graduate of Stanford University, and by that time was a professor who had developed quite a name for himself as one of the leading P300 researchers, having recently published a book about his research into event-related potentials. He was now working at the University of Illinois, and incidentally had been Fabiani's mentor when they had published her seminal paper together, which we saw earlier. Upon Fabiani's graduation, Donchin then hired a young man as his new PhD student. This man's name was Lawrence Farwell, himself a recent graduate of Harvard University. Both Farwell and Donchin had heard about Rosenfeld's recently published paper and decided to also investigate P300s as a potential detector of concealed information, with Farwell taking a particularly avid interest. Here, Farwell and Donchin designed two experiments. The first experiment was similar to Rosenfeld's experiment, in the sense that it was a mock crime scenario, though this time it was a mock espionage scenario, not a stealing scenario. In this, each participant was instructed to complete a mission, where they were then required to meet a confederate in a secret location and deliver a briefcase. Ten of these subjects completed one mission, whilst the other ten participants completed a different mission. Each of the missions had a different name, for example Operation Tiger, as well as its own unique details, such as which confederate they needed to meet and which specific meeting place they needed to go to. Each participant only knew about and performed their own mission and were naive about the existence of the other mission. Therefore, they were guilty in one mission, but innocent in the other. The next day, all the participants were then tested using EEG in a similar manner to Rosenfeld's experiment. Here, they were tested for both missions. In other words, for the one they had taken part in, and also for the mission that they knew nothing about. In other words, they were tested for the mission they were guilty for, as well as for the mission they were innocent for and naive about. And just as for Rosenfeld's experiments, these participants were also tested by observing words and phrases which appeared one by one on the screen, though this time the words were of three different types, as you can see here. The first type were the probe stimuli, which were the words which related to the espionage crime, such as what the confederate was wearing or where they had met the confederate. These were the words which probed whether the participant had guilty knowledge of the mock crime. The second type were the irrelevant stimuli, which were words unrelated to the mock crime or to the experiment, so these were similar to the Nova words used in Rosenfeld's experiments. Finally, the third type of stimuli were called targets, and these were words unrelated to the espionage mission, but which the participants were trained to memorise and recognise as relevant before the experiment began. Therefore, even though the experiments were slightly different, the logic for Farwell's experiment was exactly the same as for Rosenfeld's, in that all subjects should therefore generate P300s in response to the crime probes from the mission which they had taken part in and were guilty for, but not for the probes of the mission that they had not taken part in. On the other hand, neither group should generate P300s in response to irrelevant stimuli, and in contrast to Rosenfeld's experiment which did not use targets, all participants should also generate P300s in response to the targets, as they had been required to memorise these words before the experiment, and should therefore recognise them. And just as for Rosenfeld's experiments, this is exactly what Farwell and Donchin found, as you can see here for an example subject. The first image shows the participants' responses to probes from the espionage mission that they took part in, Therefore, this shows this participant's guilty responses, which generated the P300s. Whereas in the second image, you can see the responses to the probes belonging to the espionage mission that this subject did not take part in, and so their innocent responses. The dashed line in both images shows the responses to the probes, whereas the thick line shows responses to the targets. 
So you can see here that for the guilty condition, both the probes and the targets generated P300 responses at the PZ electrode. So you can see that the responses to the targets are larger than the responses to the probes. You can also see that the irrelevant stimulus, as shown with the dotted line, differs from the probes and targets, as no P300 was generated for these stimuli in this guilty subject. In contrast, when looking at the responses in the innocent condition, this subject shows no P300 in response to the probes, consistent with the subject's naivety regarding the espionage mission that they didn't take part in. Furthermore, the success rate for Farwa and Donchin's experiment was even more impressive than for Rosenfeld's. Here, Farwa and Donchin reported a perfect 100% success rate, at least in the sense that zero false positives or false negatives were produced. However, 12.5% of the responses were judged to be indeterminate, meaning that their computer algorithm which uses statistics to analyse the EEG responses and sort the EEG responses into guilty or innocent categories was not able to sort them in 12.5% of cases. However, this is of course an improvement on false positives or false negatives, as it simply means that more information is needed to make a determination with high statistical confidence. It is, after all, not an error, but instead a call that further testing is needed before a judgement is made. So once again, this experiment indicated that when a subject knows the significance of a crime-related stimulus, that this can be reliably detected in the brain, enabling guilty suspects to be identified. Therefore, both Farwa and Donchin concluded that P300s could indeed be used to detect guilty concealed information. However, Farwa and Donchin now also wanted to take this one step further, beyond simply replicating and improving upon the success of Rosenfeld's study. Now, they wanted to bring the test to real-life criminals and real-life crimes. For this, they used four participants who were students at the University of Illinois, and who were openly guilty of having committed minor crimes and transgressions. Just like for the previous experiments, they used the three stimulus protocol, but this time using probes which pertain to each participant's real-life crime, such as the name of the other person involved or the place that it happened. Each subject was tested on their own crime and also on the crimes that the other three participants had committed, that they themselves were innocent for and naive about. You can see the results for this experiment here, showing guilty responses on the left and innocent responses on the right for each subject. And as you can see, the pattern was exactly the same as for all of the previous experiments, in that P300s were indeed generated in response to the probes, as well as to the targets, when the participants were guilty, whereas no P300 was generated in response to the irrelevance, or to the probes when the subject was innocent. And so, yet again, there was a very impressive 100% accuracy rate, meaning that all four of these low-level criminals could be identified for the crime that they had committed using their P300 response. Also, this time there were no indeterminate results, meaning that in this experiment, all of the responses were able to be categorised statistically into either guilty or innocent determinations. Therefore, this was the first real piece of evidence to show that P300s could indeed be used to identify real-life criminals in real-life crimes. Well, the story continues with Lawrence Farwell, and from here the story also begins to get more complicated. During his PhD and his experiments alongside Emmanuel Donchin, Farwell had also applied for a position with the CIA. Even though at that time he had not quite finished his PhD, to his surprise, his application was successful and he was hired. In addition, Farwell also acquired a $1 million contract 
with the agency called 1-0 to conduct a series of further experiments on the P-300, as the CIA at that time were looking for new lie detector technology. Farwell's experiments with Donchin had already finished by this point, but it was at this time that Farwell applied for a patent for brain fingerprinting, in which he reported for the first time the P-300 MIRMA component of the ERP. MIRMA is an abbreviation, meaning a memory and encoding related multifaceted electroencephalographic response. The P-300 MIRMA is simply the P-300 plus the inclusion of what is called a late negative potential, or LNP, which is a negative dip in electrical potential following the P-300. Farwell argues that the inclusion of this late negative potential part of the signal improves accuracy in the test. Though it is unclear how exactly he knew this when he was patenting it, given that the patent came after his experiments with Donchin had already been completed and published, without any mention of the MIRMA component, and prior to his next published experiment in 2006. But anyway... By this point, Lawrence Farwell was now working alongside fellow FBI scientist Dr. Drew Richardson. Dr. Richardson himself had an impressive resume as the chief of the FBI's Chembionuclear Counterterrorism Unit, was a leading expert on counterterrorism, and simultaneously had a reputation as the leading polygraph expert for the FBI, as well as being the FBI's most outspoken critic of the standard lie detector polygraph test. Together, they received instructions to further investigate the P300 technology as a potential lie detector, and here the formal brain fingerprinting experiments began, under the umbrella of both the FBI and the CIA. However, this time, the aim of the first experiment was not to investigate its use for detecting suspects of crimes, but instead to determine whether the P300 method could be used to identify members of secret organisations. Therefore, this study was named the FBI Agent Study. And here they tested 17 FBI agents and 4 non-FBI agents, as they wanted to test whether P300s could be used to identify the agents. In this experiment, they performed the same procedure as for all of the other experiments covered so far. The only difference was that the probes were not crime-related words, but were instead words, phrases or acronyms which contained confidential information which only an FBI agent would know. In contrast, the targets were made up words, phrases or acronyms which had no real life meaning, but the agents and non-agents were trained to learn the fake meanings of prior to the experiment. And of course, the test also included irrelevance, which were again meaningless words, phrases and acronyms. Therefore, once again, both the targets and the probe should generate an information present response in the form of a P300, whereas irrelevance should generate an information absent response, in other words, no P300 response. Participants who showed a P300 in response to the probes should therefore be identified as FBI agents, in contrast to those who do not. And again, consistent with all previous experiments, this is exactly what they saw as we can see here for the result from an exemplary FBI agent, where they showed a P300 response to the probes. In the solid dash line is the target. The dotted line shows the irrelevant, and the solid line shows the probe. And here you can see that not just the P300 was measured, but also the late negative potential, which as you can see, peaks at 1800 milliseconds. So this was the first experiment which reported the entire P300 murmur response. In this way, Farwell and Richardson were able to reliably identify, with 100% success, which participants were FBI agents, and which participants were regular civilians, this time with zero indeterminate responses, due to the inclusion of the late negative potential. Therefore, Farwell and Richardson concluded that in addition to having potential to detect suspects who have committed crimes, Brain fingerprinting could also be used to successfully identify members of groups, whether they are FBI agents or criminal groups such as terrorists. After the completion of the FBI agent study, Farwell then teamed up with a variety of other researchers, such as FBI agents Dr. Sharon Smith and Graham Richardson, as well as with other organisations such as the US Navy to further test the paradigm. These collaborations included experiments which also investigated the ability of identifying members of secret groups, as well as in detecting classified information, 
and also tested the efficacy of using different types of probes, such as images instead of words. In doing so, over the years, Farwell and his colleagues claimed to have performed over 200 experiments, and in a review published in 2012, Farwell reported a 100% accuracy rate across every single one of them. Additionally, he claims that the technique is also immune to countermeasures. In other words, that participants seemingly cannot stop their brains from generating the P300 in response to the probes, and therefore can't beat the test. And indeed, Fawa offers a $100,000 reward to anyone who can beat it. But so far, no one has done so. This is in stark contrast to the polygraph test, which aside from being generally scientifically unreliable, is also known to be susceptible to deliberate manipulation by those being tested. For example, one recent case showed that a coach named Chad Dixon was training FBI agents on how to beat the polygraph test, and was subsequently imprisoned for doing so. Other cases also involve spies in all kinds of countries being caught beating the polygraph, and having been trained to do so by various organisations. All of this further boosted perception of Farwell's technique in a climate which was becoming highly critical of the polygraph test, despite the regular use of the polygraph test within the FBI and CIA, which we will look at later. Over the years, the brain fingerprinting experiments have continued, and brain fingerprinting has already been used to solve several crimes, which we will now turn to in the next section. The first crime to be solved by brain fingerprinting was the case of the serial killer called James B. Grinder. Grinder was an American male born in 1945, who raped and violently murdered three teenage girls in a triple homicide which took place in 1976. Despite the fact that Grinder was a suspect in the case, he then went on to do the same thing to yet another young woman in 1984, called Julie Helton. In this second case, Grinder became the primary suspect, but despite the fact that he would give inconsistent and contradictory accounts during interrogations, the authorities had little evidence actually tying him to any of the killings. Eventually, 15 long years passed without any progress in the cases, an awfully long time for the victims' families to endure with no closure and no justice. However, in 1998 in Macon County, Grinder and two others were arrested for a burglary and when questioned and interrogated yet again, Grinder finally confessed to one of the murders, specifically to the murder of Julie Helton. When Russellville police heard of his confession, they then travelled to Macon County to question him again about the murders of the other three victims, to which he also finally confessed. Despite these confessions, the police were concerned that they still didn't have any physical evidence tying him to the crimes, and they wanted more evidence to secure a conviction. The sheriff therefore reached out to Lawrence Farwell and requested that he administer his brain fingerprinting test on Grinder. Both Farwell and Richardson agreed to administer the test, and to do this, they used probes pertaining specifically to the murder of Julie Helton. They found that in response to the probes, Grinder's brain exhibited P300 murmur activity, as we can see here indicating that his brain did indeed contain information regarding the murder, which only the perpetrator would know. Grinder was finally convicted for the murders, and for 11 years he remained in prison, before he finally died in the year of 2010. The second case which brain fingerprinting has been used to solve is the case of Harrington v. State in 2001. In this case, a retired police captain called John Schwer was shot and murdered near a car dealership in Iowa in 1977. During police investigations, a 16-year-old boy called Kevin Hughes reported that he had witnessed the crime being committed. Kevin Hughes therefore became their primary witness, and he accused his friends Terry Harrington and Curtis McGee as being the shooters. 
Additionally, other witnesses also corroborated Hughes' accusations against these two suspects. Consequently, in two separate trials, both Harrington and McGee were sentenced to life in prison without parole. Twelve years later though, a woman named Anne Danaher started working as a barber at Iowa State Penitentiary, where Harrington was jailed. She and Harrington became close friends, and she eventually came to believe his claims of innocence. She decided to confront the accuser, who was now in prison himself in Nebraska for an unrelated crime. Surprisingly, Hughes confessed to her that he had in fact lied to the courts, under pressure from the police, and that he had done so to deflect suspicion away from himself, as well as to collect a $5,000 reward. After this revelation, Danaher then confronted other alleged witnesses to the crime, who also confessed that they had lied in their testimony to protect Hughes. Furthermore, they also reported that they had been coerced and threatened by police officers who wanted them to accuse the two boys. Furthermore, witnesses also reported that they had in fact witnessed an altercation between Hughes and the victim only days before the shooting, and that at the time, there had been specific reports about a white suspect seen near the crime scene with a shotgun. Even more damningly, Harrington's ex-coach, who had been his alibi, also spoke up, reporting that police had totally ignored his witness testimony of having been with Harrington the very night of the murder. Danaher brought all of this information to the Iowa governor, who unfortunately said that he was not interested in getting involved in the case. Furthermore, new evidence was also needed in order to be able to reopen the case in the first place. As a result, Danaher decided to contact Farwell and requested that he perform his brain fingerprinting test on Harrington to prove that he did not commit the murder. Fortunately, Farwell agreed to perform the test, and consistent with Harrington's claim of innocence, the results showed that Harrington's brain did not in fact contain the incriminating information. In other words, Harrington's brain showed no P300 murmur response to the crime probes, as you can see here, indicating that he was indeed innocent. Furthermore, Harrington's brain did show P300 murmur responses to details regarding his alibi's version of events. Therefore, the result was information absent regarding the murder and information present regarding the alibi's account, adding legitimacy to the innocent version of events. As a result, Farwell himself confronted Hughes, and Hughes agreed to take the brain fingerprinting test. Consistent with new revelations, P300 murmur responses were indeed found in his brain in response to the guilty probes. As a result, Harrington and McGee were both finally able to overturn their convictions. After spending the majority of their lives in prison, they were finally free. They then went on to sue the courts, with the Iowa Supreme Court also ruling that prosecutors had committed misconduct, accusing them of concealing incriminating reports which had indicated that these men were innocent. The men subsequently received a settlement of $2.3 million. Outside of the USA, many countries have started utilising the technique to solve crimes, including countries like New Zealand, but also more commonly in Asian countries such as Singapore, Dubai and India. Many people and police forces are very excited by its potential to solve crime and to deliver justice. For example, one biometrics company in India called Fingerscan has argued that brain fingerprinting could speed up the time it takes for detectives to investigate crimes by around 40%, and that it could also be incredibly valuable for reopening and solving cold cases. Others, however, are far more sceptical and critical of brain fingerprinting and of Lawrence Farwell. And this is what we will now turn to in the next section. If brain fingerprinting is such an amazing technique, as we have seen, then why hasn't it been used in more cases, and why aren't even more countries utilising it? 
After all, the research into P300s in general spans several decades and is extremely well established and uncontroversial within the scientific community. Additionally, Farwell's own experiments build upon this research, and as we have seen, boast a 100% success rate across over 200 studies. Yet despite this, the reality is that brain fingerprinting has actually remained controversial ever since Farwell and Donchin's initial experiments. Whilst many neuroscientists believe that the P300 has legitimacy as a potential lie detector, whether now or in the future, many neuroscientists have expressed nervousness by how aggressively Farwell has pushed the technology, with Farwell's biggest critic being the original researcher who first proposed the P300 as a potential lie detection technique, which was J.P. Rosenfeld. Over the years, Numerous neuroscientists have also attempted to test the P300 as a method for detecting concealed information, with varying rates of success, from 40 to 80%, depending on the study. This also includes Rosenfeld, who was unable to replicate the success of Farwell's experiments. However, in response to this, Farwell and his team have argued that the lack of success that other neuroscientists have encountered is a result of their deviation from his scientific methodology, in terms of administering the test, as well as measuring the electrical activity which is generated. For example, some studies have measured the electrical activity at different electrodes, which is a problem given that different electrodes record from different parts of the brain and are involved in different functions. Another difference, for example, is that these other studies tend to measure only the P300 and not the entire P300 murmur response. These are just a couple of rebuttals that Farwell has given. However, it wasn't long at all until this criticism of Farwell also started coming from Farwell's ex-mentor himself, Emmanuel Donchin. Here, in addition to general criticism of his later experiments, Donchin also criticised Farwell's patenting of the P300 murmur. Whilst the University of Illinois had patented the original P300-based concealed information test soon after their experiments together, Farwell's apparent discovery and patenting of the P300 murmur conveniently freed Farwell from the constraints of the University of Illinois' patent. As a result, Donchin called Farwell's P300 murmur discovery nothing more than business nonsense. This was of course also fueled by Farwell's attempt to merchandise his technique, which has included things like forming the company called Brainwave Science and attempting to sell the hardware internationally. However, Farwell challenges this criticism of his patent by pointing out that by measuring the P300 murmur, and not just the P300 alone, that this leads to all of the results being statistically determinate, thereby having legitimate value as a new patent. The P300 murmur results are also supported by all of the FBI agents which Farwell worked with. In response to this controversial divide within the neuroscientific community, in the year of 2012, Farwell published a paper titled Brain Fingerprinting, a comprehensive tutorial review of detection of concealed information with event-related brain potentials. Here he reviewed all of the available research on brainwave-based detection of concealed information, which had been published in English. He also proposed 20 strict brain fingerprinting scientific standards which must be followed when attempting to replicate the high success rates of his own tests, again arguing that the scientist's failure to replicate his results is a product of them having deviated from these standards. And while you can see a list of the guidelines in his paper, these 20 standards include rules such as measuring the P300 specifically at the PZ electrode, and the use of mathematical and statistical procedures such as bootstrapping in order to analyse the data, amongst various other requirements. In response to this paper, Emmanuel Donchin then teamed up with various other critics of Lawrence Farwell, which included a scientist called Ewell Meijer, amongst others. Together, they published a paper titled A Comment on Farwell, in which they argued that Farwell's 2012 review is misleading, and based upon a highly selective and cherry-picked review of papers. Donchin and his colleagues report that while some of these papers do indeed adhere to Farwell's strict brain fingerprinting criteria and report a high success rate, others in his review did not follow the 20 guidelines, yet still maintained a perfect success rate. In addition, the scientists also pointed out that some of Farwell's own experiments did not follow his own guidelines either, yet also report a 100% accuracy rate. 
In response to this rebuttal, Farwell partnered up again with FBI agent Drew Richardson, and together they published yet another paper titled Brain Fingerprinting, Let's Focus on the Science, a reply to Maija and his colleagues. Here, they refuted the claims of their detractors. Furthermore, Farwell also called upon the scientific community to conduct further experiments which actually adhere to the 20 brain fingerprinting standards that he had outlined. His opponents did not respond to his paper. And finally, to return briefly to Harrington's trial. Not only had Farwell been called to court and cross-examined regarding his brain fingerprinting test for use as evidence in Harrington's case, but the court had also cross-examined Emmanuel Donchin, as well as a third leading expert on EEG and lie detector tests, called Dr William Yakuno. And whilst both Donchin and Yakuno validated the science underlying the brain fingerprinting tests, Donchin gave the damning assertion that Farwell's selection and presentation of the specific probes was unscientific. Yakuno, on the other hand, was highly critical of the use of the standard polygraph test in the FBI, argued that brain fingerprinting is indeed scientifically valid and valuable to the court. And just like in the courtroom that day, the controversy within the neuroscience community remains divisive, and the experiments continue. Despite the fact that the CIA funded over $1 million for the brain fingerprinting experiments, and despite Farwell's 100% reported success rate, ultimately it seems that the FBI and CIA themselves have dropped the technique, but for totally different reasons than those given by the scientists who oppose it. And just to let you know, the majority of the information provided in this section of the video is directly from the Government Accountability Office Report, or GAO Report which is available online. So for context, in the year of 2001, federal law enforcement and intelligence agencies were seeking to find new techniques for their investigations in order to replace the polygraph test. According to FBI agent Drew Richardson, who as we recall performed many of the FBI and CIA studies with Farwell, polygraph tests are regularly used in the FBI as a screening tool when recruiting new FBI agents. In addition, Richardson also reported that the FBI regularly tests current FBI agents in order to detect any spies who have infiltrated the organisation. This fact was reported in his 1997 Senate testimony regarding polygraph screening and is available on YouTube. In addition, according to Dr Yakuno in a different statement to the US Senate, the standard polygraph test is responsible for large numbers of FBI agent applicants failing to pass the employment exam with many promising applicants quitting the employment process entirely. Furthermore, due to the fact that current FBI agents are regularly tested using the polygraph test, many current FBI agents were choosing to retire early, as no one wanted to subject themselves to the whims of the polygraph test or to play Russian roulette with their careers. Therefore, at this time, intelligence organisations were looking for new alternatives to the polygraph, and at least one of these alternatives was brain fingerprinting. But just to be clear, it wasn't only the FBI and CIA who were looking for a lie detection technique, but also the Department of Defense and the Secret Service, who were also funding different experiments performed by Farwell, though their own desired use of the test is not clear. So on the 31st of October 2001, the federal agency released the GAO report, which I mentioned earlier, which is a review of brain fingerprinting which the US Senate had requested. To create this report, the federal agency interviewed Lawrence Farwell, as well as Yakuno, Donchin, Rosenfeld, the FBI agents involved in the studies, as well as various other colleagues that Farwell had worked with. In this report, officials representing the CIA, FBI, Department of Defense, and the Secret Service all stated that they do not foresee use of brain fingerprinting. However, perhaps surprisingly, their reported disinterest deviates from criticisms regarding its scientific validity, or lack of validity, but instead focuses primarily upon its unsuitability and limited application as a screening tool for investigating FBI agents and recruits, 
as well as its limited applicability to the Secret Service. The reason why brain fingerprinting is not suitable as a screening technique is because it depends upon the FBI having obtained a high level of information regarding incriminating activities, because after all, this confidential information needs to be known by the experimenters in order to be used as probes, and unfortunately this information may not actually be known to the intelligence organisations who want to administer the test. The wording of the GAO report and its focus upon the need for screening and security therefore suggests that this was in fact the true priority of these intelligence organisations, as opposed to finding a technique for use in crime investigation. This is also in correspondence with the reports of an unspecified former CIA polygrapher who had worked with Farwell, who stated that the CIA had wanted something which functioned more like a conventional lie detector, and that once they realised it couldn't do that job, they stepped away from it. Furthermore, in addition to brain fingerprinting's lack of suitability as a screening method, intelligence organisations also commented on the high financial cost of the technique, such as for training and equipment, which were cited as reasons why they were not interested in pursuing it further. Most crucially though, and most damningly from a scientific perspective, the federal agency also concluded that Farwell had not provided the FBI and CIA with enough details about the algorithm that he had used in his test, and that Farwell had refused to provide this information as his technique was proprietary as a result of being patented. And unfortunately, the federal agency did not perform their own technical analysis of brain fingerprinting, whether by assessing the hardware, software, or by replicating the experiments independently of Farwell. And so they simply dropped it. since the FBI experiments, the P300 as a detector of concealed information continues to be investigated by neuroscientists around the world. Whilst many are sceptical of its application as a lie detector, many others believe that with further research it may someday be a legitimate technique. The latter perspective is also argued by even the most vocal opponents of Lawrence Farwell, including both Emmanuel Donchin and J.P. Rosenfeld. For example, Rosenfeld has been quoted as stating that brain fingerprinting is indeed a sound idea that's not quite ready for prime time yet, and that just because one person is attempting to commercialise the technique, that this does not mean that serious scientists should abandon their efforts. On the other hand though, the position held by the intelligence organisations seem a little more confusing. It is counterintuitive, for example, that all of these intelligence agencies spent so many years and so much money organising and funding these experiments. Yet if we are to believe the GAO report, the primary reasons for ultimately dismissing the technique were supposedly because it wasn't designed to be a screening method and because it was too expensive. It is therefore unclear why they designed and funded these experiments if that was ultimately their aim and such a method was out of their budget. Such reasoning makes it sound like the technique was doomed to fail, even though there was supposedly this 100% accuracy rate across all the experiments. But that being said, they are of course by nature secretive organisations with plenty of concealed information of their own. And in fact, Farwell was quite open about the reality that many of the published brain fingerprinting experiments were kept secret before being published. And so who knows whether these organisations did in fact pursue it further, or what kinds of alternative technologies they chose to pursue instead. Maybe there was simply a better option that they have kept very quiet about. But that being said, there are some interesting details to all of this. Firstly, it is strange that they allowed their leading scientist in other words, Farwell, to patent the technique and withhold the details of how the algorithm works. This is made even stranger by the fact that whilst the first official FBI-funded experiment was the FBI agent study, 
If one actually looks at the small print of Donchin and Farwell's paper which outlines their experiments together back when Farwell was a PhD student, you will see that these experiments were actually already being funded by the CIA, even at this early point. And in that vein, it is also interesting that there is such a split between how Donchin came to perceive brain fingerprinting versus how the intelligence personnel that he worked with perceived it. Despite all of these people having worked directly with Farwell on the brain fingerprinting experiments, Donchin alone had a damning view of Farwell's technique, whilst all of the intelligence personnel that he worked with supported it. So on the one hand, you have the neuroscientists who think that the technique does have potential, but who are highly critical of Farwell himself, and on the other hand you have the intelligence personnel, who were also scientists, praising Farwell and his technique, and yet whose organisations ultimately rejected it. And given that Donchin and Rosenfeld's criticisms of Farwell and the use of the P300 as a lie detector only came after Farwell started his experiments with the FBI, some might argue that the split in opinion might have occurred simply as a matter of scientific rivalry, as both Rosenfeld and Donchin were indeed the first two original investigators who proposed this method of lie detection. Others, however, could criticise Farwell for refusing to disclose the algorithm that he used, as reported in the GAO report, as whilst his information is protected due to being patented, as a scientist, his lack of disclosure can be viewed as highly suspicious. It is also unclear if anyone who worked with Farwell knew the algorithm either, and how this might have influenced any opinions that these scientists or intelligence personnel had. And on a slightly different note, there is also an argument to be made that the P300 technique might simply be facing unjustified levels of scepticism and scrutiny as a result of the poor reputation of the polygraph test, a shadow which would now be even harder to step out of given Farwell's aggressive business promotion and pushing of the technology. There is also the matter of the established research underlying the P300 in general, as well as understanding of the preceding peaks and dips in the event-related potential. If one accepts that a certain peak or dip correlates with a certain psychological correlate, then why should the P300 be difficult to accept as a correlate of memory? Having said that, one huge criticism of the scientific validity of brain fingerprinting is memory itself, and its fallibility. In recent events, and just a month before the creation of this video, a whole new type of news report was released on the topic of brain fingerprinting. Here, Bloomberg reported that in the early months of 2023, Lawrence Farwell had been caught in a scheme to market unauthorised and modified versions of the brain fingerprinting code to international government agencies, something which he did not have permission to do, as the version of code that he used was part of a new patent, which belonged to Brainwave Science Incorporated. And whilst you might remember that this was a company that Farwell had co-founded, he was in fact fired from it back in 2016 after being accused of fraudulent misrepresentation and attempted theft of corporate assets. When Farwell was taken to court for this crime, he was also found to be in contempt of court as a result of drafting and circulating fabricated FBI reports. These fabricated reports were written on papers with FBI seal letterheads on them and they disparaged Brainwave Science Incorporated. However, it transpired in court that Farwell had literally copy-pasted the FBI seals onto the documents in order to make them appear as though they were written by the FBI, an organisation that Farwell was actually no longer affiliated with. As a result, Farwell was ordered to pay Brainwave Science Incorporated over a million dollars in punitive damages in March 2023. Of course, it is important to be clear though that Farwell's patents prior to the year 2016 have not been accused of being fraudulent. And finally, amidst all of this controversy and confusion, both Farwell and Rosenfeld have continued to conduct and publish these experiments, amongst other scientists. As for the remaining characters in this story, Emmanuel Donchin sadly passed away in 2018. Audrey Richardson was killed in a tragic accident at his home, for which the details are not available online. As for other neuroscientists, the divide in opinion remains, and the future of brain fingerprinting remains concealed.